What's missing? I guess you need more information than just that question. Right? As you read over that gospel passage this morning, were you missing something? John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one who the Isaiah said, A voice crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John wore camel's hair, leather belt, ate locusts and honey. Sounds like a hippie to me. He's got a camel hair jacket and he eats healthy food. So, right? And then all the people from around were coming out to him to be baptized, confessing their sin. And then he saw Pharisees and Sadducees coming to, to where he was baptizing. Bad translation there. And he said to them, you brood of vipers, who told you to flee from the wrath that is to come? Make sure your lives show what it needs to. Do not presume that you are safe by saying you have Abraham as your ancestor. For the axe is lying at the root and the trees are going to be cut down. And those that bear good fruit will be okay. And those that don't are going to be thrown into fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful is coming, and I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor and gather the wheat into his granary, and the chaff will be fed to the unquenchable fire. What's missing? The good news. Is that what you said? <laughs> no, there's good news there. There's absolutely good news there. Uh, okay, so since, since we don't really know that, we'll have to talk a little bit then. This image at the end here of Jesus is not one that we normally have for Jesus, right? Of a man standing with a pitchfork in his hand, clearing out the good and the bad. When you normally think of someone holding a pitchfork, who do you think of? Satan. Yes, who said that? Satan? Yes. Right? This is the, the image that most of us have of, of the devil, right? Horns and a pitchfork and unquenchable fire. And, and here, in the third chapter of Matthew, we see that's Jesus. But that's good news. Believe it or not. So what's missing here this morning? From our passage of John the Baptist out in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance. Asking people to come into the water to confess their sins and to be baptized. You see, John's baptism is a baptism of repentance. It's not the same as Jesus' baptism. It's not the same baptism that we do here. And I'm pointing over here to the baptismal font, right? Even though it's back there in the corner. Because this is normally where the baptismal font is at. It's not our baptism. This is not the baptism in which each one of us was baptized. It's different. Because John's baptism is about repentance. And what does repentance mean? To turn around or turn away. Right? I don't really like this translation. What? We baptize into new life. But that's not what's missing. (laughs) We will get it by the end here, people. I believe me. Matthew chapter 3 has an interesting verse in there. Repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. Right? John the Baptist is out in the wilderness and he's proclaiming to these people to come and to repent from your sins, to confess your sins, and to be baptized. And repentance is this thing where we, we say we're going to, to not do the things that we've always done. Repentance is this thing where we confess our, all the stuff that's wrong in our lives and we turn away from it and we change, our, we, we change what we're doing and we follow after God. It's all about what I can do for myself, right? Maybe, maybe not. Richard Jensen, I believe. Yes, Richard Jensen in the book Touched by the Spirit says this. This is his definition of baptism. The daily baptismal experience has many names. It may be called repentance. Unfortunately, repentance is often understood as I can experience. I'm sorry for my sins. I can do better. I can please you, God. So often we interpret repentance as our way of turning to God. That cannot be. 
Christianity is not about an individual turning to God. Christianity is about God turning to us. In repenting, therefore, we ask the God who has turned towards us, buried us in our baptism, and raised us to new life to continue to work in us, putting us to death. Repentance asks, repentance is an I can't experience. To repent is to volunteer for death. Repentance asks for the death of self, which God began to work in us in baptism and continues through to this day. The repentant person comes before God saying, I can't do it. Myself, God, kill me and give me new life. You buried me in baptism. Bury me again a day, again today. Raise me to new life. That is the language of repentance. Repentance is a daily experience that renews our baptisms. It's not, I'm sorry I've done wrong and I can do better. It's, I can't possibly do this without you. So come and kill me and make me be the person you want me to be. Repentance is not about us doing the work. Repentance is about us accepting who God is and allowing Him to do the work for us. Because you see, the word that is missing is missing throughout most of Matthew's Gospel, and we'll talk about this probably most of the year. But it shows up in the one place that it doesn't show up in any of the other Gospels. And it's something that I normally say as I'm standing at this table. In a night in which he was handed over, Jesus took bread. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it to disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he lifted up the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, this cup is the new cup in my, cup given in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. There's no forgiveness in Matthew chapter 3. It's not about your sins being forgiven. It's not about you coming to God and being put into the right place because you've done something of talking about all the bad things that you've done and saying, I'm not going to do those anymore. It's all about us understanding who Jesus is at the end of this passage. The man who's standing in the the granary with a winnowing fork in his hand, separating the wheat from the chaff. Because that's what, when we get to that passage and we read that, we think that one is bad and one is good and, and we're either one or the other, right? Because the Pharisees and the Sadducees came and John said, you brood of vipers. Which isn't a very nice thing to say at all. Um, Actually, if your kid said that to you in that day, you would have washed their mouth out with soap. It's a heinous thing to say to somebody. So we think that they're bad coming to witness this. We think that they're bad coming to see this. We think that they're bad because they want to come and stand over against this. So therefore, when we get to the wheat and the chaff, one of us has to be wheat and one of us has to be chaff. And we can't be in the, in the presence of the other, right? So my question to you this morning, and I want to see a show of hands. Who's chaff? Who's wheat? Oh, you got to be one of the other people. Come on. Everybody has to raise your hand at least once here. Are you chaff? Are you wheat? Not everybody. What is this? This is particip- that you are, you're not all participating. I, d- did you hear what I said? You have to raise your hand at least once. Who is chaff? Who is wheat? Right. Those of you that kept your hand up are right. The rest of you have something to learn this morning. You see, when wheat grows, how does it grow in the field? It grows up and what is the, the wheat comes up, right? And it's a whole plant. And there's the, the part that we take to make our, our bread and flour out of, right? Flour out of in the middle. And what's around the outside of that? The chaff. It's all one plant. It's not two different things. It's all the same. 
And you see, when Jesus is standing in the grain area with his fork and he's lifting you up, the way they separated the wheat from the chaff is they flip it up in the air, right? And the wheat that was heavier would fall back down and the chaff would blow away. So what Jesus is doing to you is he's taking your life and working through it and getting rid of all the bad gunky stuff that you don't need and making you be the thing that's going to produce fruit. He's making you be the thing that's going to be that that shoot out of the stump of Jesse that's going to go out into the world and share his love with everybody. Because that's what he wants us to do. That's what it means to be about repentance. You see, that, that line about repenting is not necessarily the best way to look at that. I did some research. Those of you that are my friend on Facebook saw me post like 25 different versions of Matthew chapter 3 verse 2 this morning because I was looking to find different versions of it. Some different versions of if you want to look at your version while I read this. Turn to God and change your way, the way you think and act because God's, because the kingdom of God is near. John said, change your hearts and live because the kingdom of heaven is near. In saying, reform, come, reform, for come nigh hath the reign of heavens. That's an interesting one. I like that one. Here's a really good one. Change your hearts and live. Here comes the kingdom of heaven. And John said, change your hearts and live because God's kingdom is now very near. One I didn't get in here that I want to read for you. The message version is, change your life. God's kingdom is here. So when we talk about repentance, we think that it's something that we have to do, that we have to talk about all of the gunky stuff in our lives, and we have to give, we have to say that we're sorry for that. And I'm not saying that that's not a good thing to do, because it is. It's good for us to, to go th- work through all the gunky stuff in our life, and to say that we're sorry for that, and to say that we're not going to do that again. But truly, repentance is us understanding that we can't do that by ourselves, and that we need God to come into our lives and do that for us. It's a complete reorientation from our inward searching of who we want to be to an outward searching to looking to God and understanding who He's calling us to be and following after Him in everything that we do. Because you see, that's what's going to lead us to the true love that we have because the Spirit and fire give us love. In case you're wondering what the sermon title is this morning, right? The the little bird plus the, the flower as Carrie and I talked about this past week. It's a dove... And it's a flame because he who is coming after me is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And through that, he's going to clean out all of the gunky stuff from your life and make you be that perfect fruit that's going to show his love out into the world. So as we wait for the coming of the baby, as we wait for the coming of our Savior to come back and take us to be completely with God, allow him to use his fork to get rid of the gunk in your life. And allow Him to show you what true love is. And to make you into a fruitcake. So that you can go out into the world. Yes, I just called you all fruitcakes. Be a fruitcake and go out into the world. And show His love and grace and mercy to everybody. Because that's what He needs for you to be. Someone that's going to believe that He's doing the best for you in your life. And follow Him wherever it is that He's leading you. So go. And show His love. And help everyone to understand. That the baby coming in a manger... Is going to give us a life that we can possibly imagine. But if we can follow him, it will be the ride of our lives. Is that like the Yeah. <laughs>